Well, hello and good morning. It's me, Kenny Polkar, your host of the party. And today is Wednesday, February 15th, 2024. And here are some of the things that you need to know about what's going on in the market. So you're going to say, wait, was that it? The pullback is over. We just had a 1.8% pull down, pullback, and now it's over. The buy the dippers come in, right? They came into the rescue. Tex and Smids were the biggest beneficiaries, and it makes sense because they were the ones that got hit the hardest. Oil slightly weaker on demand concerns again this morning. That's like exhausting. Gold trying to stabilize after the CPI report. And uh, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby leaves the door open on rate cuts, right? Wall is a little bit more suspect. Now, what will the ECB and the other Fed heads say today? And what do we have at dinner tonight? Well, we're going to have the halibut with uh, clams and leeks. It's really delicious. And mushrooms, it's really delicious. Okay, so look, stocks rally on what I think is more of a dead cat bounce, right? Rather than signaling the end of any kind of a pullback, or dare I say, a correction. I mean, on Tuesday, the Aldos couldn't get out of the room fast enough after the CPI report, right? The pressure on stocks was immediate. The sellers ruled the day and the buyers were happy to step aside to buy stocks at slightly discounted prices. And I say slightly because what was it really? I mean, the Nasdaq had rallied nearly 30% in three months from November to February. On top of the 35% that it had rallied between January of 23 and October of 23, right? That's a 65% move. And then they declined by 1.8%? Really? Are you kidding me? That's what everyone's getting nervous about? I mean, look, we've all lived it. Valuation soaring, any mention of anything AI sent the broader market up single digits while it sent anything tech up double digits, right? This on top of the better than expected economic data and cooling inflation and talk of a soft landing, strong jobs growth, historically low inflation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then we get this slight uptick in the latest CPI and the algos go into shock. And the markets get sprayed with waves of sell orders and stock falls as buyers take advantage of the fear. And then it's all good, just like that. The buy the dippers thought we had dipped enough, apparently, right? They came in and they scooped up some of these stocks and then uh, causing stocks to then rally, right? There's no doubt about it. The Dow, the, the stocks rally, the Dow was up 151 points or four tenths. He has to be up 47 points or 1%. The Nasdaq tacked on 209 points or 1.3%. The Russell added 47 points or 2.4%. What clearly the outperformer. And remember what I said to you yesterday morning. I said yesterday that it was the Russell and the transports that had gotten two black eyes versus just one. They both lost 4% and 2.6% respectively on Tuesday, right? This versus the down 1.5% for the other indexes. So while we're going to see lots of bargain hunters, I would expect to see more of them in those sectors. But remember, yesterday's losses may not be one and done. So tread lightly. And that's exactly what we saw, right? Money moved into the spins because they got really beaten up. The transports, on the other hand, only gained 38 points or a quarter of a percent, which is a sign of weakness while the equal weight S&P gained 62 points or one full percent. Bonds, which got clobbered on Tuesday, rebounded yesterday, right? Naturally, they did. The short end of the curve carrying the load. The TLT and TLH gaining uh, half a percent apiece. The two-year fell by nine basis points, so prices went up. And the day yielding at 4.57, while the 10-year yield also fell by eight basis points and the day yielding four and a quarter. And yes, both of these bonds are well below the yield seen in October when the markets really get frustrated, right? When the market gave back about 8%. When the two-year was yielding 5 and a quarter percent, the 10-year had ticked just above 5%. So the fact is, that is helping investors' psyche, right? And as you would expect, it was anything tech that led the way up. The XLK up 1%. The semis up 2 and a quarter. Disruptive tech up 5.5%. Expanded tech up one7 Robotics up 2%. These were all the sectors that took it the hardest on Tuesday. I mean, it's almost a mirror image, right? Semis lost 2% on Tuesday, but they gained 2 and a quarter percent yesterday. Disruptive Tech lost 5.5% on Tuesday, but it gained it all back on Wednesday. The same with Expanded Tech, down 2% on Tuesday, and it was up 2% on Wednesday. Which means what really happened, other than all this chaos, right? Anyway, the only two sectors in the S&P that failed to move up yesterday were consumer staples, Kind of boring, right? They were down two tenths. And energy, down just one tenth of a percent, right? All the other sectors ended the day higher, with many of them gaining back most of what they lost on Tuesday. But remember, 
when something falls by 2% on one day and it rallies by 2% the next, it's still not completely back to where it was, right? A $100 stock that falls 2% is now worth $98. Now, if that same stock then rallies 2%, it's worth $99.90. Yeah, we can argue over the 10 cents, but the fact is it needs to rally slightly more than 2% to actually get back to 100. Look at the industrials. The XLI lost 1.1% on Tuesday, right? All the, and all the hysteria. But it gained 1.7% yesterday. So that ETF is actually worth more money this morning than it was on Tuesday, uh, than it was on Tuesday night, even Tuesday morning for that fact. And so here is the issue with long-term investors that they need, uh, that, they, that they try to time the market. Say you sold your XLI on Tuesday because you got all nervous about the CPI report. And then you put that money in cash. Okay, great, no problem. Uh, and then on Wednesday, Chicago's Fed President Austin Goolsbee comes out and says, hey, he's not worried about this slight uptick in the CPI and that he expects maybe two or three months of higher CPIs, but that does not, in his opinion, change the narrative of cooling inflation. And then by default, potential rate cuts. Now, he didn't say that explicitly, but he didn't have to because that is what the markets heard. And so the algos go, Oh, whoops, rate cuts are still alive, time to get back in. And it rallies back, right? Taking back all the losses and then some. So now what do you do? Do you jump back in thinking the pullback is over or do you sit tight and you wait? And then what happens if it is over and the industrials continue to go higher? What exactly did you accomplish? You want industrial exposure, but you just blew it out. And now you have to get back in. You see the hamster wheel that you're on there as a long-term investor? You're completely uh, you're avoiding so much of what you do. If you maintain your XLI position, because the fundamental story did not change, and, and, and it continued to sell off, then you'd get a chance to add, it, add to it at lower prices, building your position. The real question to ask is, did something fundamentally change with the industrials, or is it just the weakness that the algos created, right? The havoc that they created. Because if nothing fundamentally changes, then why would you blow out the position if you are a long-term investor, right? Do you think Warren Buffett blows out positions every time the market has a pullback? I would argue absolutely not. In fact, he's exactly the opposite. He's the investor that you want to emulate when things get antsy. Now, speaking of Warren, this morning we learned that he, in fact, did trim his Apple position by 10 million shares. Sounds like a lot. It's less than 1% of his total position. So don't go up and make assumptions that he's changed his mind on valuations of Apple. For him, it's really just, it's a housekeeping issue. But when did he do it? He did it when it was rallying over the past two months. He didn't, he sold it into strength. He didn't sell it into weakness on Tuesday. He's a buyer on weakness. Again, as long as the fundamentals have not changed. And that's the mindset that you have to put yourself in. Now, all I'm saying is the market never moves just in one direction forever, right? Like I said yesterday, trees don't go to the sky. The hell were you thinking? Valuations get stretched, and then they reprice. The repricing most times depends on how stretched they were. Other times, the repricing can happen because, in fact, the story changes. And as a long-term investor, you have to be able to know the difference. If you're a day trader or a more active trader, then none of that makes a difference to you anyway. You just want to buy them and sell them. So you want to hear the, the chaos and the havoc, right? You are looking for a reason to hit both the buy and the sell button because that's what you do. But as a long-term investor, that's not what we do. Now, this one of you futures are up. Dow futures are up 60, the S&P's up 7, the Nasdaq's ahead by 20, the Russell's up by 14. Not dramatic, but they are up. Right? There's more eco data due today that's going to give us additional clues on the state of the union. And the way futures are acting, they're not expecting anything traumatic or dramatic, right? We're going to get Empire Manufacturing, we're going to get retail sales, and then retail sales, X Autos, and gas. We're going to get Philly, Bed, uh, Philly Fed business outlook, we're going to get initial jobless claims, continuing claims, industrial production, capacity utilization, and business inventories all due out between 8 30 and 10 o'clock. Tomorrow, though, is going to be the other key data point of the week, right? It includes the latest PPI report, which details inflation at the producer level. And after Tuesday CPI, many are sitting on the edge of their seats. Well, we, uh, we're also going to get housing starts tomorrow, building permits, and the University of Michigan uh, sentiment surveys, which a lot of people pay attention to. It's not ever, anything that I ever really put a whole lot of, uh, lot of credence in. Anyway, oil pulled back a bit yesterday uh, on a crude U.S. crude inventory bill. 
it was, which was up more than expected. It rose by 12 million barrels versus the expected 2.6 million. And that's causing some angst because they're trying to tell us that the build speaks to waning demand. Are you kidding me? On the other hand, gasoline inventories fell by 3.7 million barrels, which was 2.5 million barrels more than the expected, right? Which suggests that demand is strong. So which is it? Is demand weak or is demand strong? And in the Mideast, both Kazakhstan and Iraq said they're reviewing their production to address any excess output uh, above the OPEC limits, right? Now, OPEC meets again in March, where they're going to decide what to do going forward to curb supply and keep prices elevated, or at least try to keep prices elevated. Any sign that they're going to impose new quotas is going to send prices up, right? And any sign that they're likely to do nothing uh, will likely then continue to put some pressure on prices, something that the Saudis don't want to see, right? They need oil to trade in the 80s in order for them to balance their budget. This morning, oil is trading at 76 bucks. It's down about 60 cents, leaving it resting right on the support trend line at 75, uh, 75.50. So 75.50 will be a level to watch. Gold, which got clobbered on Tuesday on the idea of no rate cuts, tested as low as 2,000, down some $40 from where it had been hanging out. This morning, it's up $3 at 2007 as it cautiously interprets comments made by Austin Goolsbee. Is the rate cut narrative really still alive? If so, gold traders will take it right back up. So watch what happens to get a sense of at least what the gold traders think is going to happen next in terms of Fed policy, monetary policy, uh, and rates, right? Now, uh, while Austin said one thing, Fed Vice Chair of Supervision, uh, uh, Mikey Barr, said something slightly different. He said that the Fed needs more data showing that inflation is easing before they start cutting rates, which just leaves it a little bit confusing and open to interpretation once again, creating kind of ongoing volatility. Today, we're going to hear from ECB President Christine Lagarde, ECB Chief Economist Philly Lane, Atlanta Fed President Rafi Bostic, Fed Governor Chrissy Waller, what will they all have to say about the U.S. and European rates and policy in those parts of the world and where it's going or where it's not going? Stocks in Europe this morning were mixed. U.K. and Spain were down. France, Germany, and Italy are all up. The U.K. is now in a technical recession, which is, uh, which is also word salad. Either they are in a recession or they are not. The U.K. economy contracted by three-tenths of a percent in the fourth quarter, and the third quarter was revised lower to negative uh, a tenth of a percent, which means that's two quarters of negative growth, which means they are in a recession, not a technical recession. Growth is negative for two quarters. That is the definition, period. Now, unless, of course, they're suggesting that the readings are not correct or that they're changing the long-held definition. In any event, markets are mixed and awaiting commentary uh, over there by those two uh, ECB voices. The S&P managed to close directly on 5,000. Not above it, not below it, but directly on 5,000, right? Making some investors think, ah, the repricing is over. It's all good. I'm not sure that I'm buying that argument, but like I said, that's what makes buyers and sellers. A 1.8% pullback in the S&P on one day does not represent a pullback. Absolutely not. I'm still waiting for more of a shakeout so that I can put more money to work. Because remember, I didn't sell anything on Tuesday. In fact, I did add to a couple of names but I'm waiting to really add to more, to a wider range of names uh, with some cash that I have just sitting there waiting, which is sitting in the government market, money market fund making 5%. So it's not sitting there doing nothing. Anywhere between 5,000 and 5,050 still feels toppy to me at the moment. So I expect more backing and filling, right? So I expect the market to back off. Call me to discuss. I'm always happy to have that conversation with you. Okay. So now, what are we having for dinner tonight? So we're going to have this halibut with mushrooms, leeks, and clams, right? It's really a delicious, it's easy to make, and it's delicious. It sounds more complicated than it really is, but it does make you feel like you're at the beach, and you can feel the sand between your toes, right? Uh, it's really, it's really, it, you'll enjoy this one. Okay, so for this, you need Pacific halibut, because the Pacific Ocean is colder year-round versus the Atlantic, and the fish does not fall prey. The Pacific fish does not fall prey to some of the parasites that exist in the warmer waters. Atlantic halibut is best eaten in the colder months when the water is at its coldest. Otherwise, if it's the summertime, you want to try to get Pacific halibut. 
So, so for this, you need the halibut, you need mushrooms, preferably oyster mushrooms, uh, butter, you need three large leeks, salt and pepper, chicken broth, two dozen little neck clams, and some chopped Italian parsley. You wanna season the halibut with salt and pepper and just set it aside. Season it on both sides and then just set it aside. Now you're in a big in a big uh, saute pan. You want to start by melting the butter uh, over medium high heat, uh, medium heat, right? Don't let it burn. Uh, once it's all melted, you're going to add the sliced oyster mushrooms, like two cups, uh, and then you're going to add the sliced leeks. Trim the leeks. Use only the white and the light green part of the stock. Don't go all the way up. Discard the rest. Season it with salt and pepper. Reduce heat to medium low and cook it for about ten minutes or until the leeks are nice and soft. Now add about three cups of chicken broth and then raise the heat to medium high, right? Let it come to, let it come to a boil. Now add the fish and the clams to the saute pan. Wait for it to reboil and then reduce the heat to low and then cover it. Cook it for about six or seven minutes, making sure that all the clams have opened. If you still have some unopened clams, remove the fish and then uh, the, uh, the unopened clams and continue to cook for another three minutes or so to give the uh, stubborn ones a little bit more time if they need it. If they don't open, just take them out. At this point, throw out all, uh, throw out any of the unopened clams, right? Now, serve this dish in a full-size bowl. Shallow is the best, right? But it's a bowl. Uh, bathing it in the clams and the broth topped with the mushrooms and the leeks. Sprinkle it with some chopped Italian parsley uh, uh, at the very end right before you serve it. And you can enjoy this with a crisp, chilled white wine. And you know me, my go-to favorite for a chilled white wine is Pinot Grigio Santa Margarita. In any event, it's another gorgeous day here in Florida. It's Thursday, so we got two trading days until the weekend. And then it's a long weekend. Don't forget, Monday is a holiday. But until tomorrow, take good care.